of whether pigs have wings. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Sasquatch Shields. We're Sasquatch Shields, so you don't have to. So, uh, yeah, I'm gaming a little bit higher this week. We're going to listen to what uh, Mr. Reagan has to say. If you if you haven't checked him out, he has some really horrible jokes and some right wing political commentary, but he also has a few points. So don't just sell him out immediately. Of all the countries in the world that send money and other forms of aid to impoverished nations, the United States is by far the most generous. Americans really? give more dollars than people from any other country. Americans give seven times more dollars per year than the average German, 14 times more than the average Italians, and that's not because of income and it's not because of taxes. It's a true cultural difference. Right. A quarter trillion dollars a year of charity uh, by Americans. That's right. Now, that's actually more than the whole national income of Sweden or Denmark or Norway. That's how much we get. Because, you see, Americans are not actually evil racists. Oh. And that is a really important point to make because if you're a leftist, you know, we're going to stick with that because I like that point better. All right. So we got a guest backstage, Mr. Logan Albright, author, entrepreneur, YouTuber, and reviewer, among other things, apparently. So he's going to have to explain all of that stuff to us. How are you doing today, sir? Oh, wait, you outnumber me. Hold on. <laughs> I'm doing really well. It's nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, brother. I appreciate you coming. Um, most people aren't nearly this punctual. Usually I start drinking by now. I'm three shots in. Hey, it's after five here. Go for it. Um, yeah, I guess so. I'm not doing it. Nope. Not today. We'll do that on a celebration night. Let me do a little thing, a little bit of housekeeping right here and get this done. Smile because you're on candy camera. There you go. Good enough. Um, all right. Okay. So <clears throat> how long have you been tooling around on YouTube? Uh, I started the channel maybe about four years ago, and I just did it as sort of a way to build my personal brand and create a profile for myself. I was writing books, and I wanted to have an audience to promote those books to, and I like to read books. And so I thought, ah, I'm writing books, I'm reading books, let's talk about the books that I'm reading and see if I can get some book enthusiasts interested. So that's kind of my motivation behind it. started it about four years ago. I upload once a week, and I've been doing it ever since. Huh. Your uh, glyphorous is all get out. I don't think I can find books maybe one i think about a three week gap maybe two week gap and i don't know if that was just i mean you never know uh this isn't a life that everybody can just lead all the time you know yeah i've definitely missed a couple of weeks over the years but i'm trying to be as consistent as i can oh man you're amazingly consistent I, I, that's what i was saying is it, you have an amazing work ethic when it comes to that type of stuff um some people wouldn't upload that often doing it full time yeah, and I'm yeah. not exaggerating. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd like to upload more, but I'm I'm kind of real time uploading uh, reviews of books as I'm reading them, and uh, I generally can't get through more than about one book a week, and so I really couldn't upload more often if I wanted to. Um, I read some other, I mainly do fiction books on the channel. I read a lot of nonfiction books that tend not to make it onto the channel, but in terms of getting through fiction, um, I get through about one book a week, and so I talk about it. And I'm, at this point, I'm pretty much reviewing everything that I read. You know. I've always had an issue speaking intelligently on a book as soon as I finish it because it takes my brain maybe a couple of weeks to actually digest the concepts. If you, if you get what I'm saying, totally. there are some, some books I'll start reading and because I get to something that hangs me up in my head and I can't get over it mentally, I'll just set it down and wait until I process that concept and come back to it later and back up a little bit or maybe read the whole thing over again. Yeah, and I guess doing this sort of changes the way you read a little bit because now whenever I'm reading a book, I'm always kind of thinking in the back of my mind, what am I going to say about this in a week when I finish it? And what am I going to say on the channel? And not every book lends itself to in-depth analysis and 
Not that I, what I do is particularly in depth. It's, I try to keep my videos to about 10 minutes each and uh, be concise. But, you know, sometimes there's books that you just don't have that much to say about and you have to figure out how to review them in an interesting way. And there's a few books that you could spend an hour and a half on and still not really get get into it real good as, oh, as much as that sounds weird, especially when you get into series, you know. Yeah, that's definitely uh, true. And uh, I have a few longer ones, but in general, I try to keep them, you know, to a reasonable length because I just don't think people have the attention span to. Hey guys, it's a cold I'm sorry. Book. That was supposed to be muted. No problem. <laughs> I do believe my internet is fixing to crash. Maybe, maybe not. Oh, it's on the ragged edge, y'all. Is it still so much, I'm moving? So much heat for, this for lighting that candle and putting it on my bookshelf. Everyone thinks I'm going to burn my house down doing that. I know what I'm doing. Guys. I'm, I'm not going to burn my house down. You're an adult, correct? That's correct. I've been lighting candles since before you were born. Possibly. Oh, this is going to be a full-on disaster show. I see how this is going to go. <laughs> I just heard my my wife in there complaining about the the, the internet. She she just went to yell at about what just happened. So maybe it'll clean up here in a minute. Maybe not. Uh, I tend to have like major problems between like six thirty and about ten. After that, <laughs> it clears up. I'm in, I'm in a small town. I'm pretty sure everybody on Earth just got off work and went home and started playing Raid Shadow Legends. Shadow Legends. Yeah, everybody's turning on Netflix at the same time and doing all those things. Or I might have a virus. I am a dirty, dirty boy. Um, what's weird is watch this. Yep. Oh, it's not going to do it today. Yeah, no. Just just changing windows and changing back does it. That's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. And it's been doing it for a couple of weeks. I can sit here before I go live. I can sit here. And fiddle with all this stuff and it will work flawlessly i could have showed you the whole show no problem but as soon as i go live it starts doing this and, and i know what you're thinking it's uh it's the lag induced by going live but i've got a little gauge over here that tells me how much of my my signal i'm using and it's telling me i'm fine and over here it's telling me that this particular window doesn't have a connection but all the rest of them up here are fine it could always be a problem on YouTube's end as well. I always get trouble with them sometimes when I'm trying to watch stuff too. So you never know. Yeah, I never know. I never know, man. I'm sorry. I'm just I'm distracted. Um Hey Princess, welcome to the show. We got a few people in here actually. Can you see the chat at all? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, cool. Um oh, that was ineffective. That's not the one I want. I want this one. All right, so Mama Gnome gets the gold, Workline gets the silver, and Princess OPD gets the bronze. I guess she's Princess OPD this week. You know her cat is 17 years old. Wow, that's pretty good. Yeah, no, she's, uh, I'm not even joking. That thing is also uh, fairly gargantuan. We had a cat like, with that even... once, but that's pretty rare. Um. I lived out in the middle of a, a very rural swamp. Our cats didn't make it very long, and we never found out what got them. Yeah, that'll happen out in the Always wild. A, like that. Always a mystery. I have an idea. It probably won't work, but it's worth a shot. Maybe, maybe not. I think I have a conflict with my mouse, too. Because sometimes when my mouse starts dying, it'll straight up glitch out my whole system. Like all of my um, all of my visuals will collapse back down onto my taskbar, and I can't see any of it. And it just started with this last OBS update. And I don't mean by clicking anything; I mean just moving my mouse around on the screen. Suddenly, poof, everything collapses. That's weird. It is weird. It is so strange. No, none of those tricks work. It's not how it works. What's up, a non mouse? I'm over here having a glitch fit, and, and, and it's giving me the hives. <laughs> it's called technical issues. And if it wasn't for technical issues, Sasquatch would have no issues. All right. So you do books. What books have you written? 
Oh, I've written several books. Um, I've written a bunch of novels that some of which I've self-published. I haven't actually had any uh, picked up by a real publisher yet, but I do have two books out by real publishers that are nonfiction. And the first one of those was a couple of years ago, and it was called Our Servants, Our Masters, How Control Masquerades as Assistants. And that was sort of about the myth of the public servant, about uh, politicians and bureaucrats and people who claim that they're out there to represent your interests are actually out there to get power for themselves and to control people. And that was kind of my thesis of that book. And it came out, uh, it was published by the uh, American Institute of Economic Research. Uh, and then the book I had come out last year is a book called Our Servants, Our Masters. I have it up here behind me on my bookshelf. Not Our Servants, Our Masters, that was the first one. This one's called Conform or Be Cast Out. The Literal Demonization of Nonconformists. That's, that's the one I was looking up. Yep. And this uh, is about basically the societal tendency not only to dislike and um, you know, be uh, exclusive of people who don't conform to the norms of society, but also to like actually literally identify them with some kind of metaphysical evil. So it's the history of people who have been weirdos and strange people and oddballs and doing things that are a little bit different. And not only is it, it's not good enough for society to just kind of shun them. They have to also say, well, they must be in league with the devil. They must be casting evil spells, things like that. Right. And it's like surprising how often that's come up in history. It's come up so many yeah, times. I swear to you. I would have been burned at the stake. I think a lot of us would have, you know, and it's uh, it's pretty interesting. And I'm a big defender of people's right to be different. And I like people who are a little bit strange and a little bit out of the mainstream. And so I, I really have a soft spot for those people. And it makes me upset when I see people going after them and trying to, you know, demonize them both figuratively and literally. So that's why I wrote the book. And I think it's pretty good. I'm, I'm going to check it out. And I've got another book coming out uh, probably next year. It's in copy edits right now with the publisher. And that book is called Libertarian Paganism uh, because I'm both a libertarian and a pagan. And I think that the two ideologies overlap in some surprising and interesting ways. And so uh, that was my thesis for that book. And I, I wrote it um, a few months ago and it's in the, with the publisher now and it's going to come out next year. So I'm very excited about that. You would be correct. Because um, the current framers of the Constitution were a lot of them were deists. And yeah. theists, which is not the same as, as to say Christian and you know secular at all. These people had very odd notions that you wouldn't expect necessarily. Yeah, the Jefferson Bible is a really interesting document because it's like right? stuff he liked about the Bible with all the stuff he didn't like crossed out. It's really fascinating to see what he thought about it. It, it is. It really is. And I've probably met three people who have actually had a good look at that book. You know, and four now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the person who told me about it and a person I told about it. <laughs> Plus you. <laughs> yeah. It's really interesting. And yeah, I I, I uh, love that kind of stuff. I love thinking about it. I love writing books. I hope I get to keep writing books. I hope to get some uh, novels published at some point. I'm still working on that. But, uh, you know, and then I thought YouTube was a good place to talk about them and to talk about the other stuff that I'm working on and reading. Be the change you want. All right. So <clears throat> can't remember the name of the channel. It'll come to me. Um, I, I had a previous guest who attempted to, uh, for public safety, who literally ran, ran for local office in order to try to exert change in the local police force and was simply not allowed on the ballot. No, never a reason was given. He got the allotted number of petitions signed and whatnot. All the dot, dots were crossed and T's were dotted and all that stuff. They said no. They, they didn't even really give him a reason. And I was like, okay, yeah, be the change that you want to see. But at the same time, you have to do the thing. <laughs> you know, the thing. <laughs> I absolutely agree with be the change you want to see in the world. I'm not at all convinced that politics is the method mechanism to do that in. I'm right. I'm of the opinion that politics is just so inherently corrupting that it's almost impossible to get involved in it and still be a good person and hold true to your ideals. And so I ne never intend to run for office of any kind myself. And I kind of strategically laid booby traps for myself along the way so that if I ever do run for office or want to, there'll be things that my opposition can dig up to stop me from running. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, I think that living living your values and serving as an example to people of the way you want the world to be is absolutely on the right track. And that's something I try to do. I, I don't quite live by that philosophy. I have a, a much, much simpler philosophy. I, 
I'm I'm recovering from every drug known to man. And so I just want to live tomorrow slightly better than today. And I try to live today a bit better than yesterday. That's it. That sounds sounds like a really good philosophy to me. I think that like capitalism is important in that respect. Like so many people are, they're, they're only obsessed with like making huge giant changes in the world. We have to change everything. We have to, you know, solve these giant problems. And it's like, well, maybe one thing at a time, put one foot in front of the other. The journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, all that kind of thing. So I think it's a good philosophy. I have a, uh, a thing that I do, I call failing forward. I don't tell people what I'm doing. I might drop hints. I might say a little bit about it, but no one ever actually knows what the end product is supposed to look like. And so sometimes I put out things that I think are utter failures, but I put it out there because I did the work and people love it. And then sometimes I put things out that I think are awesome and nobody cares. And it's, it's a little disappointing, but it's very humbling. It, it keeps you, it keeps you humble. You never because, know. You just never know. Yeah, what's no, you know. What it is. And I think that like a big predictor of people's success in life is their, their willingness to fail, their tolerance for failure. Because if you're afraid of failing, then you never try anything. And if you're not afraid of failing, you try everything and sooner or later it's going to hit for you. Either way, it's not going to work. It's too much. Um, the way I kind of look at it is I expend enough effort and resources forward so that when i fail no one around me realizes it's a failure they just don't see it that way because clearly i mean you're succeeding and i'm like well you know in my head it should have been better (laughs) but i I I don't think anyone is ever really satisfied with what they've done (laughs) they want to do better so not if they're a true artist no sir i don't think they're ever satisfied at all So uh, you've got a whole boatload of uh, book reviews, and you're looking into starting movie reviews of various types, uh, Blu-ray. Uh, I, I don't know. You might want to look at the uh, streaming services for your sources. There's a couple of free ones out there that are pretty cool that have some public access stuff that's non-copyright. It's it's hard to find and sketchy, but it's not as hard to use clips from it as it is like PBS. Don't ever touch PBS. They'll, mm-hmm. they'll burn you. <laughs> they'll burn you. Yeah, I, I, just, uh, I love physical media. You know, I'm like, I've been very resistant. Maybe it's just my age and being an old timer at this point, but I, I've been very resistant to this whole, like everything has to be digital. We're going to have all our music on our phone. We're going to have all of our books on our tablet. Um, you know, I like to have the physical object that I can hold in my hand and I don't really feel like I own something if uh, another company can like delete it from my device without my knowledge. And so um, I like to collect physical objects. I like to have books. I like to have Blu-rays. I like to have CDs. I still, I'm one of the only people I know who still buys CDs in massive quantities. And so uh, I like to talk about that stuff. So I'm probably going to start branching out from, I've already done it a little bit, but I'm probably going to start branching out from book reviews and do some some Blu-ray reviews, some CD reviews, things like stuff, other stuff that I care about. Because I, I absolutely love movies. I absolutely love music. I'm a huge music fan and I, I'm a musician myself. And so I'd love to like have an outlet to talk about all that stuff rather than just talk about books. But I've kind of built my built my current audience on books. So I have to take my time branching out and building in some new uh, new viewers. Yeah, I, th- I think you're a shoe in for uh, expansion because the format lends itself to it. Uh... You could just set up a new playlist and not mention it. Yeah. Have you played with premieres at all? No, I really haven't. I don't think I have enough subscribers to really, uh, to warrant it. Like I feel like if I did a premiere, nobody would show up to it, but yeah, I should probably start doing that. I would advise no more than one a week. I'm a little bit crazy. Don't follow my example because I do all of my work and like, I'm a little manic depressive. So I do all of my work in like big bunches. And then I won't do nothing for like five days straight. <laughs> and when I'm in a work zone, like I just, I don't, I don't do anything long enough for it to matter. It's like an hour here, two hours there doing this, that editing, catching clips, coaching clips, watching live stream, you know, everything all at the same time. 
Totally. I'm one of those guys who will listen to an audio book, have a video playing while I'm editing and watching something on my screen over here. Oh, and I'll have a, t- uh, a movie playing on the TV. You used to work in a movie store. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> you were in a movie so, store? Wasn't that great? Yeah, no, I spent um, it from about 1996, 95 until 2008, 2009, working uh, a small town movie store with an iguana and some chihuahuas and the I'm people guessing, that own. I'm guessing you had to do most of the work. I, I mean, it's a movie store. It ain't a whole lot of work. No, I don't think the iguana was pulling its weight. Is what I'm saying. Uh, the iguana was definitely pulling its weight. You would not believe how many people we had come by and just hang around outside eating gumballs, just staring <laughs> at the iguana in the window. I had a job at a record store for a couple of years, and I loved it. I thought it was a fantastic job. It's a, it went out of business, and I had to stop. But like, I was having a great time just talking about music all day. Mm-hmm. Oh, dude, I sat at that movie store. And, and have you ever seen Empire Records? Yeah. You know how happy their life was before it all went to crap? Yeah. That was the life I led through high school because anytime I got stressed out, I could just go to the movie store and put in some hours there and didn't have to deal with the outside world. And because it was a fairly large movie store, when, you know, you have a rush weekend, you've got to check up on all the tapes, make sure they don't have any prawn injected in there anywhere or any damages or anything like that. So I ended up watching a whole bunch of stuff I had no interest in at the time. But later, things sunk in, if you get what I'm saying. Like, I used to hate Rocky Horror Picture Show. Really? I just, I didn't get it. I didn't, I just did not understand why everybody was such a big, big, huge Rocky Horror fan. I didn't get it. I worked at a movie store. I had to watch that thing like twice a week, every week for eight years. Sorry, I didn't get it. It wasn't until I hadn't watched it for like a year and then it came on in the middle of the night that I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to watch Rocky Horror Picture. What am I doing? Uh, I don't want to interrupt you. Z is asking what type of novel I'm writing. I wanted to answer him real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm currently working on a horror novel about kind of a, like a tech billionaire who decides to take a break from his hectic life and go live in a cabin in the woods. And it all kind of goes wrong for him, um, which I think will be a lot of fun. So that's what I'm working on now. But I, I don't really stick to one genre. I've written 13 novels at this point. I think I write one every year for National Novel Writing Month, which is November. So I got to get ready for that coming up. Um, but I write one every year, and they're always a different genre. It's whatever the idea is. Like I have ideas for fantasy novels. I have ideas for science fiction novels. I have ideas for horror novels, literary fiction, historical. Like just whatever I'm feeling like I want to work on that year. Um, so is there a Logan verse? No, there's not. They're not all really like in the same universe. There's just okay. You know, I have lots of ideas, and I want to get them down sure. on paper. And so uh, I always am kind of mystified by those writers who spend their entire career working in one genre, like Stephen King or someone who just writes horror novels over and over and over again. I'm you like, know, Don't I you have, have some ideas for anything else that you want to work on? That Stephen King never wanted to write horror, that he actually wanted to write fantasy, but he hit, hit it big in horror and just went, <sighs> fine, it's a haunted lamp. It's uh, a haunted I, car. I think my first five or six novels are on Amazon and self-published. And um, so you can get those citizens if you want them. Um, the rest of them that I've written, I'm kind of holding until I get a real publisher and then I can publish them all. Um, so I'm still working on that, but I, yeah, the, the first few are on there. So check them out, see which one thinks uh, you think sounds appealing. Oh yeah, baby. I'll definitely do that. And I went back and edited the, uh, Hey, AJ, welcome to the show, darling. I went back and got uh, those links linked into the um, description. So it's already in there. And when I go back and edit the episode, I'll get those links also. And as far as I can tell, at least up until the show started, they worked. Now, YouTube's weird and sometimes kills links when you start and go live and stuff. I don't I don't know why. I've had problems with that. But, right. but if they don't work, I just remove them. Yeah. And anyone can just go to my, my personal website is my name, loganalbright.com. And uh, it's got links to everything that I do there in the different venues. So it's kind of a one-stop shop. And I link the the stream back to your about page that has all that information and links to that information. So that works pretty well. 
At least I think it does. I did something like that. Maybe that was last week. I don't know. All the days are blending together. <laughs> so what, 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 what does a man who writes about everything get himself for Christmas? Oh, there's an endless supply of things that I want. Mainly, I love I love books and music is the main thing I get myself, but a lot of musical instruments too. Like I'm running out of room in my apartment for musical instruments because I play the guitar and a couple other things. Oh and, yeah, uh, and I just like love to buy musical instruments for myself. Um, but there's all kinds of stuff I'm interested in. You know, I, I'm sort of a, a jack of all trades, master of none, where I just I, I'm interested in the world, and so it's, it's an endless supply of stuff. All right, they work. The links work. Super. That's fantastic. Yeah, thank you. We got several folks in here. We, I'm pretty sure, I'm almost certain that one of these people, or two of these people is one person, but I can't remember which ones it is. <laughs> I'm almost certain. Um, then we've got Show Me Sasquatch in here. It's good to see him. We've got Snark and Sass, friend of the channel, previous guest. She even made the uh, highlight reel at the beginning. Citizen Z, Ajok, good to see you. Um, well, you were okay. talking about Rocky Horror Show, which I think is a great movie. I love that movie. It's a, it's a great movie. I'm not debating whether or not it's a great movie. What I was saying is it was so such a high volume rental. We had five copies. And so every week, at least one of those copies would have to be checked to see whether or not something was wrong with it because it reached whatever playtime it had reached a rental load or whatever we got to watch the whole thing all the way through and so there were times i had three copies of rocky horror picture show playing at the same time you know there's a sequel to that movie called shock treatment i had read that and i think i watched it but i didn't associate it with rocky horror i think time. it's just as good as rocky horror but no one's ever heard of it i mean the music is just as good the plot is like really actually prescient it's about kind of like reality tv before reality tv was a thing um, it's it's really funny and interesting, and it's a it's a very strange movie, but I love it, and I think the music is just as good. So, if any fans of Rocky Horror out there, check out Shock Treatment. It's very good. And don't forget your spoons. <laughs> That's right. Gotta have the spoons. I'd be sitting there at two o'clock in the morning with five or six of my friends, getting towards the end of Rocky Horror, and everybody throws spoons at the damn TV, and I'd be sitting <laughs> around going, now I know I'm autistic, or these people are crazy. I don't know which one it is. I've been to a couple of the live shows, and it's always a little bit, depends on where you're going, but sometimes it's a bit much, you know? Like, uh, you can't hear the movie anymore because everyone's shouting over it the entire time. And if you get a smaller group, it's a lot of fun, but larger groups, it can be overwhelming. In my experience, every time we watch the movie, you can't hear the movie, movie for everyone saying the lines in the movie, so you don't really need to hear it because the guy next to you has got it down pat. Right. <laughs> Just look at him when they're talking. It's fine. Um, okay. So you're a very busy, busy individual. What's up, Press Harder? Good to see you, people. Sorry. Um, and and that would uh, that would stretch me pretty thin. Like I've never been able to sit down and write. The one time I did get most of the way through something I thought was starting to become a novel, and and I think you know what I mean by that. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Just don't. They don't, <laughs> but this one was like getting along there. And then one day I woke up and it, the, the device it was on crashed and I took it to the place to go get it checked out. And they were like, well, it's all corrupted. Oh man. Like, I'm That's taking it home. You got to back, back up early and often. This dude, this was like eight years ago. I was still strung out on every drug known to man. And I was writing, I, this was part of my recovery, trying to get out from under all that crap. I was writing maybe. 50 pages a day just kind of right and i guess i don't know how many pages i ended up in there with but uh that crashed and it just took all the heart out of it you know yeah i know i've had i've lost some stuff too and it's just hard to get yourself back motivated to work on it again after that happens and like finishing the thing is by far the hardest part and like starting a novel is easy because you're excited you have your idea you're like yeah i'm gonna put all this down and then You've been working on it for six weeks and you're just like, I'm sick of these characters. I'm sick of this story. I don't know how it's going to end. I feel like everything I've written is garbage. You know, like having the will to do something is so hard. Way far in there, dude. In that, in that tablet, in that tablet, I have 70 pages of 
cross-referenced individuals so that I could keep track of who was who and what was going on because it deals heavily in identity politics and clones. Oh, yeah. Right? So number two is not the same as number 52. And the chapters were named after the clones, not after the the chronological. (laughs) Yeah, no, it was highly complex and highly confusing. It was intended to be. And I was starting to get to the point where I was tying it all, nice little bow on it. I wake up, turn it on, and I'm like, it won't turn on. Why won't it turn Rachel, why won't it turn on? It's broke. I don't want it broke. It can't be broke. I need it back. I need, I need all of that. Because it wasn't just that. There was that book, and there were two other like recovery things I was working on that were basically just like a novelization of the experience of trying to get clean. That yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. There's some stuff in there I'd really like to have back. God knows how many pictures. Eh. can't make it happen kind of got to let things happen sometimes so what's up ozzy good to see you bro boa why don't you come in with the other seven profiles and like the stream that would make it look good at least on paper right (laughs) so um have you considered doing like when you were talking about expanding out your reviews? One of the things I try to do with my guests is I basically question them about their lives a little bit and get an idea of what they do that they don't include on YouTube. You have a very set format. You have this very formal sort of, uh, you have this box you use to do your reviews, right? Right. Set, I suppose. Um, with a little editing, you could edit in any type of situational uh, commentary into that without having to change your set or change your format very much. It's just when you start swinging the book around at people, right? Because you're making a point, just it cut to a different to whatever it is you're talking about instead of the book. You know what I mean? Right. So if you're if you're doing a cave, like you go on a vacation or something, you could do just raw footage and wander around, chat about it, and then go back and do the review later. Oh yeah, absolutely. it's a matter of adding content width and breadth to increase your uh, community base. Yeah, because hashtags yeah. takes more than hashtags. I'm actually going um, on a on a vacation to the UK in a couple of weeks, and I'm going to pick up a bunch of books while I'm there. So maybe I'll uh, get some footage of some travel footage to fold in while I'm doing that. Absolutely, I'll tell you what you do. Every time you stop more than about ten minutes, film a short and just tell people. We look at the camera and tell people where you're at. You'd be surprised. Shorts has a totally different algorithm and can revitalize a channel that seems to have stagnated. Yeah, I haven't really experimented with shorts yet. I've got to figure that out. That sounds like a good idea. Do you use OBS or a phone? Either one. Uh, I just use my phone. Okay. So when you're using a phone, you just have to get it into the right uh, view format, vertical, Mm -hmm. like portrait mode. And this talk to the damn thing. Keep it under 54 seconds, and any type of editor should work fine after that. Uh, even the little YouTube one that adds two seconds so that things aren't shorts anymore. Just keep that one in mind. <laughs> and they've got all kinds of tools to play with over there. Once you get into the shorts, a whole bunch of like overlays and sounds and stuff you can add to it. You can, There's stuff to play with. Uh, AJ, AJOT over here, and... um snark and sass are both much more expert in that whole making shorts thing than i am i just kind of fiddle with it you know oh we have we have a new outro i have created a new outro with my very good friend hunter yes sir i did that thing i did it right before you came in in fact i barely made it it it, is i I think it's going to be good (laughs) holistic media i like that See, that's using your brain pan there, buddy. I love clever names. I was always real big on having clever names. And so you could figure out if I was trolling you by looking at the names in your chat, if they all made a little bit too much sense. (laughs) It was probably me trolling you. (laughs) And I'm not going to give any examples at all because I'm retired. I don't do none of that stuff no more. I do everything above board, most of it live. So if I'm trolling, I'm trolling in the real time. 
Got Wandering Hippie in the chat. It's good to see him. Mexican long hair is here. I figured you'd have been and gone live and took all my viewers from me. That's what I expected. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I would like to see you expand into movie reviews before music reviews. Yeah, I'll probably do that because I just bought a bunch of new movies for uh, the Halloween season. I love horror films. I love Halloween season. So I've got a huge like haul that I want to go through and do some uh, some reviews of stuff that I just picked up. So that's probably right. next for me. I got a pitch for you on that one. Sure. I've been um, wanting to do something of like a live reaction type show and then go back and edit the reactions down so that it's a, it's an actual reaction video instead of being a copyright hellhole. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just get the bits that are funny. Leave the rest of it out. Uh, probably 10 minute videos. It'd take what? Two hours to watch a movie basically. So yeah. it would be something that would be done in stream yards backstage without any public involvement. And then it would later be uploaded. Uh, if I was going to do that, we would probably just establish a joint channel elsewhere for that type of stuff, but it'd be something we would do one video a week or whatever. It wouldn't be real time for us. And I don't care what movies it is for that matter. Hey, Danny May, welcome to the show. Good to see you. Um, yeah, I've never got into reactions largely because I've already seen everything. Um, I mean, I haven't seen everything, obviously, but all the stuff that people react to that does well. Yeah, like, yeah. Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, like I've seen all that stuff. You worked and, in a movie store. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've seen them all. <laughs> and, and because I worked in a movie store and started that whole education much, much younger, I was maybe eight or nine when we first started uh, frequenting that place. And then I got a job at about 12 or 15 where I'd just unlock and lock doors, basically. It was only later when I was like 17, 18 that I actually started running the joint. Uh, that was when I really got into finding like esoterica movies like Slaughterhouse and uh, Slaughter Farm um, is the one I was thinking of. Yeah. I think. yeah. Slaughter Farm. Are you familiar with Slaughter Farm where the guy poops out? Slaughter Farm. Sounds like a good one, though. Black Devil Doll from Hell. The only uh, yeah. streaming service have you ever, you've never heard of Black Devil Doll from Hell. Never heard oh, of Black Devil friend. Dog from Hell. No. Oh my friend, go check out Black Devil Doll from Hell. It's it's worth the watch once. Don't, okay. don't don't thank me. I got one more movie I want to shout out to you, and then we'll do the next bit in the show. Yeah, go uh, for it. All right. So there's this movie called Deary Off the Wall. Some friends in Florida put that together. I've never met these people, and they don't have any idea who I am, but I absolutely love their work. You know about cars? Yes. I'm a paleontologist. Oh, it's okay. There's dynamite in this bag, too. Oh. I am a paleontologist. I'm a paleontologist. Paleontologists study really old stuff. Like crackers. Because bad movies are funny. And that's the point where your first video generally is supposed to play. Right? <laughs> and it doesn't play today because all of our gizmos don't giz or mo. Well, that's fine by me. I don't need to go back and watch something I recorded three years ago. I'm perfectly content not having to see that again. Right. I'm going to go back to the absolutely amazing mustache that I found over here. Is that right? No, this one. This is oh, the yeah, one. Oh, right. oh, I got Another the wrong book. one. I'm going to totally poach that. Which one's running? Uh -oh. Review for your viewing pleasure. And today I'm talking about the science fiction classic Time Enough for Love by Robert A. Heinlein. I've done another Heinlein book on this. Actually, yeah. That's the one I want playing. Fantastic. Time Did y'all see all weirdness? Yeah, I didn't see none of that, did you? Everything's fine. We're professionals. <laughs> right? Right. Right? <laughs> Good book, though. Recommend it. One of my favorite mm -hmm. Heinleins. Time Enough for Love. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, I strongly advise anyone that's going to read Time Enough love for Love and hasn't already to read Stranger in a Strange Land and Methuselah's Children first. Neither one will make any sense, but when you read Time Enough for Love, things will tie together with a nice little bow, and I don't mean by them sharing a universe as much as I do mean by conceptually. Yeah, I actually haven't read Methuselah's Children yet, but I like uh, Stranger in a Strange Land a lot. It's a real good one. Okay, so 
Methu- all right, Stranger in a Strange Land, Methuselah's Children, Time Enough for Love, The Cat Who Walks Through Walls, and uh, Podkin of Mars, I think, are all in the same Heinlein verse. Well, There's a few others. Huh? If Heinlein wrote it, I read it. I told you, I was raised by Robert Heinlein, Arthur C. Clarke, and Isaac Isomov, more than yeah. probably. Uh, E.E. E. Doc, uh, Bill Williams, Harris. E. E. Doc Smith. E. E. Doc Smith. Yeah. And uh, Harry Harrison, The Adventures of the Stainless Steel Rat is one of my favorite series ever. Ever. And if you're not familiar with Harry Harrison, he wrote The Misplaced Battleship, hmm. which is about a super criminal who assembles an old world galactic class battle battleship out of a space cruiser. He built a personnel ship. But instead of having personnel put on it, he put the weapons on it. <laughs> so it's basically a battleship. I haven't read him. I'll have to check him out. Sounds pretty good. I do love Arthur C. Clarke and Asimov, though. Both great writers. Uh, in All right. So Harry Harrison doesn't have quite the technical savvy as like uh, Arthur C. Clarke by, by no stretch of the imagination. But like even Asimov, who went a little further afield in the possibility of, of things, uh, Harry Harrison goes even farther. He just assumes that things will be solved by technology, and so he simply imagines the technology that would solve that problem. So there's things like microscopic nuclear weapons, portable black holes. (laughs) In this universe, there are super planet-ending weapons that any idiot can go out and buy. (laughs) You can just download it on the internet or whatever. I mean. He just assumes that if there's a problem, technology could obviously solve it. <laughs> he might be right about that. You never know. Are you a Philip K. Dick fan? Oh, absolutely. Do androids dream? Wait, do androids count electric sheep? Do androids dream? Dream. Which dream. one is it? Yeah. Yeah, I love, like his his short stories are for my money the best short stories in the business. I think they're incredible. I'm like Quite just awesome. kind of getting into his novels more recently, but I've read all of his short stories that he published, and I think they're just like he's the best. I'll tell you another one as far as like Philip K. Dick. I'm pretty sure he's the one who wrote Kubik. Yeah. Uh, that book has an awful lot of the same flavor as uh, Podkin of Mars and um, The Cat Who Walks Through Walls, which has a bit of a multiplicity of disciplines in it that's not normal Heinlein. I feel like he read some Philip K. Dick and then went and wrote those two books. Entirely possible. Um, do you have a particularly es- esoteric author that you like that most people don't know about? Oh, okay. I'll give you this one. Um, this is someone nobody knows about, but he's amazing. Um, his name is Harry Stephen Keeler, and he wrote like kind of pulp detective novels from the 30s, but he was legitimately insane, and his stories make no sense, and they're crazy, and they're so much fun. And it, like he comes up with the most ridiculous names for his characters. The plot twists are just so bizarre. You never see them coming. He does things like not introducing the killer in his murder mystery until the last <laughs> page. Like you don't meet the killer until the last page of the book. Or he does things like um, the narrator is the killer. Things like uh, even better. I love off the wall. Things that like you know by the the handbook of how to write a mystery would be considered very bad writing but they're so crazy and off the wall and so much fun. They've all been republished by this publishing house. Um, like you can't get a lot of them on Amazon, but if you go find the, the publisher that puts them all out, they put them all out again. And they're, they're all just so funny and just unique and different from everything else. Cause he was legitimately nuts. Harry Stephen Keeler, highly recommend. Harry Stephen Keeler. All right. I found uh, out about him because there's a writer named Ken Keeler who worked on Futurama and the Simpsons. And he right. was like uh, one of his audio commentaries. He did. He's talking about it he has the same last name and he was like oh yeah i have the same last name as Harry Stephen keeler and i looked it up and just loved his books they're incredible well, that's cool i always like finding new authors that i hadn't heard of uh i'll tell you something that's a huge 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 resource that a lot of people just don't bother using librivox has an amazing selection of just free to use free to own free to download just go listen to it but and once you start messing around in LibriVox, other 
things that may not be liver livervox but are all but are available on youtube start popping up in your feed so there's all kinds of stuff out there i tell you a really good one and i didn't expect it i actually bought this book i think i was coming home from texas um with my el camino and we stopped at this uh hotel this really crappy hotel and uh they had this book bin out in the front, like right in front of the front desk. And I, when I first showed up, I walked in and I saw this picture of a hamster on the front of a book. And it was like, oh, yeah, I got to read that. Right. And so I just grabbed it, and took it home. And the name of the book is Columbus Day. Um, what are we counting down to? Am I going to explode? Have you sent me a bomb? Do not do that. <laughs> Please. I'd rather get like a, a raw salmon. <laughs> An entire poly pocket set i mean be clever about it don't just hurt me and don't damn sure don't let me limp away from this crash i'm not i'm not up for it what's up axioms revolt good to see you brother she's counting down and I'll, i'm scared now <laughs> she, she's uh she's like super hacker or something she's gonna come get me main character passes by on the street on the first page oh yeah no, um, I always liked uh, the Miss Marble, Miss Marple mysteries. Mm -hmm. Always really, really tickled my pickle growing up because the author in this case was Ag Agatha Christie. She was so particular in her details before she named the killer that while you might could have guessed it, you'd have to be thinking around corners. Yeah, Agatha Christie is the best. Um, I think I've done three of her books on my channel, and like she's her books are like little puzzles. You know, they're not just like yeah. stories. You have to work out as you're going along trying to figure it out. And she's so good at that. She was the classic. I haven't read many of the Miss Marvel ones. I've read mostly the Hercule Poirot ones. Uh, but yeah, Miss Marvel. Some of the like, her Poirot ones. Yeah, yeah uh, she's Miss Marvel has some of the best lines out of all of Agatha Christie. I know Perot has the little gray cells and he has his little sayings, but Miss Marple was not the one dropping the sayings. It was people talking about her. Oh, that woman's so sharp, she's going to cut herself. Or uh, her mind is as sharp as a bacon slicer. Or be careful, Missy, or you'll slice far too thin with that mind of yours. You know, <laughs> absolutely glorious little catch lines, hundreds of them. I think one of the best ones is uh, in the mirror cracked from side to side. And it's one of those about the breaking slicer. I always loved uh, Raymond Chandler for his sayings. Like he had the best sayings for uh, those kind of pulp writers. He'd say things like, uh, like uh, he was a blonde to make a bishop kick a hole in a stained glass window. Right. Or he stood out like a tarantula on a slice of angel food cake. Like those Raymond Chandler lines are my favorite. They're so great. Just completely off the wall. Yeah, it makes no sense at all. All right. So uh have have you gotten around um setting up any kind of like uh media tours or anything like that? Do you do you do any of that self promotional stuff that some authors do? I do a little bit when I have a new book come out. I'll uh, do some signings and some speeches and whatever I can get people to accept me, but that's about the extent of it. And uh don't have a big yeah. enough audience to support much more than that at this stage. Oh yeah, just go for what you can get. Yeah. Uh, mainly, smile and pretend like this is exactly what you wanted to do. In every case, never yeah. let them see you sweat. I, I hate to say fake it till you make it, but there are days when every one of us will come to the podium and not be able to perform. And so, what you have to do is. Pull your panties up and do it anyway. Oh yeah, totally. I've I've done my fair share of public speaking throughout my career, and I, it, you know, I'm fairly comfortable with it. It's to me, it's a matter of knowing what you're going to say. You know, if you know your subject really well and you feel like you're you understand it, it's not that hard to talk. Um, where I've gotten into trouble is when I'm trying to talk about something that I don't really know or understand. Like when you're trying to do a book report in college or something, or you know, uh -huh. a presentation, and you haven't really done their homework. That's when it gets hard. But if you know your stuff, like the, the book that you've written yourself and you've been thinking about for the last six months, it's not that hard to talk about it for a while. That's true. That's true. Uh, that's one of the reasons why these shows go so well is I don't 
just invite random people on. I know it might seem that way, but I'll, I might go through eight or 10 people in a given community before I reach somebody that it interacts with me in a way that makes it possible to do a show. You Ozzy Manuel's The Starting Out P.G. Woodhouse was another one of my favorite writers. I love P.G. Woodhouse. Hilarious. Hmm. There's a book named Chrysa Chrysalis. Chrysalis, yes. And it's about this kid who meets a fairy. And they have a conversation from the kid and the fairy's perspective only to realize that like 22 years had passed since she had started the talk and she walks out a grown woman. That's the inevitable That's danger of really dealing with weird. fairies. You always it's get something really like weird. That. that sounds like something I would like. I'll have to check that out. It's where I learned the word Wittershins. So if, I can't remember the name of the author, but he was a really uh, kind of esoteric author. But the name of it is Chrysalis with like a Y somewhere in there. Might be George McDonald, now that I think about it. That actually sounds familiar. That might be right, actually. I, it was another one of those uh, uh, hotel pickups where it's like free books, Ben. And I just reached over and grabbed a book to mm -hmm. read as I read. And it tooled around in my duffel bag for about eight months before I finally opened it. And it just sucked me right in because it's all about this kid who goes out walking and sprains her ankle. And then it goes weird after that. She's gone for a week the first, or he's gone for a week the first time. They've been out searching for her for a week. I, love, I absolutely love fairy stories. So I'm definitely going to check that out. It sounds like the kind of thing I would really enjoy. Oh, yeah. It's, it's good stuff. Um, he did a bunch of short stories under different pen names, and I can never remember because I always mix up the pen names and his real name, and then I mismatch the, three, the four names, you know. So I, I don't even want to try it. <laughs> but he did a bunch of those uh, pulp like um, magazine bits back in the 50s and 60s. That whole thing. Yeah. I don't think he ever got a whole lot of notoriety doing it, but I stumbled across him and I went looking for some of his other stuff. Like I don't think he ever made Hugo or anything like that, but he was a steady contributor. That's really what every platform needs of steady contributors. Absolutely. Definitely. I very much take the uh, mindset that if you just put enough stuff out there, something's going to hit at some point, you know? It's like even a blind pig finds a truffle every now and then. Right? Well, uh, yes. Yes, blind pigs do find truffles. Absolutely. But wouldn't it be a nose blind pig that randomly finds a truffle? Don't they sniff I, out the truffles? I think the word is agnosmic. Yeah. A nosmic. Thing. A Nosmic is unable to smell, yeah. I'm just going to keep you around for defining things while we're in mid-conversation. Just tap me on the shoulder and be like, that means this. I love words. Words are the best. Words are fun. Words are tons of fun when you can play with them. Sometimes they don't play fair. Definitely true. What was the joke? My wife accused me of stealing her thesaurus. I was both aghast and... uh. Oh, I lost it. I was appalled, aghast, and overcome. <laughs> I think I still screwed it up. Basically proving that I stole the thesaurus. You got to explain a joke. It's no good. You know what you did, bud? You did a show. Yeah. You did a great job at it, too. Um, you want to you wanna do a, a, a closing spiel? Tell, tell everybody everything from the beginning? I'll sure. You know, give a list of your books or whatever you've got handy. If I can find my pointy thing, absolutely. Pointy thing. We're gonna do this this way. Skadoosh. All right. Hi everybody. Thanks for watching. My name is Logan Albright. I have a YouTube channel where I review books and other physical media. I'm an author. Uh, I write novels and I write nonfiction books. My most recent book is Conform or Be Cast Out: The Literal Demonization of Nonconformists, which is about the way society throughout history has tried to marginalize people who are different by identifying them with some kind of metaphysical evil, like the devil or you know, magic, evil magic and spells and things like that. Um, so pick that up if you get a chance. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm also going to start doing Blu-ray reviews and uh, music reviews and all other kinds of things. And uh, I do music. If you go to my website, loganalbright.com, you can find my Bandcamp page there, put out some electronic music. 
and I write and I do all kinds of other stuff. So feel free to check that out. And thanks so much for watching. And thanks to the Sasquatch for having me on. Yes, sir. Absolutely. I appreciate you being so punctual, man. I can't tell you how many times I've had people show up like three minutes late. That's Sometimes one of my great things. things out of my punctuality. It's my superpower. I'm never late. I'm the same way. I'm always 15 minutes early. I'm one of those weird guys who might get picked up for stalking because I just showed up to look at the scene first. Yeah. I, I don't walk into anything I haven't looked at before. And so if, if I say I'm going to be there at 2.30, I'm probably going to be there at 1.00. If you're not 10 minutes early, you're late in my book. Exactly. Well, I'm I'm earlier than that because I don't like walking into anything blind. I'll park down the street and just sit there and watch people come and go for a while. I'm, yeah. I don't, I'm not in no hurry and no rush. I would rather do my research and not get embarrassed by it. Yep. All right, I'm going to drop you out right quick. I'm doing a little talk out and let them hear my new outro. Um, If you want to stick around for After Dark, you can. If you've got things to do, I understand you can opt out at any point in time. But the way this goes is I dropped the link in the um, chat. Previous guests are preferred. If anybody wants to come up, we spend 10 minutes. Wait. If they don't show up, everybody have a good night. If they do show up, we talk to them for a little while. You can leave when you're ready. Okay. Sounds good. All right. We'll be back with you in about four minutes. All right, ladies and gentlemen, y'all know how this goes. It's not the end of the show, but it is the end of the show, so we're going to stick around for another show that's coming up later. In fact, I have, what's that, Hunter? Oh, my man wants to tell you a little something, something. So I'm on. Sorry, sorry. Good news, though. We're going to have to move the party somewhere a little bit more private, but you're all invited. Lorenzo will give you the details. Yeah! <laughs> Hey, she was a cutie in a sundress yeah. I told her I just had to confess I got a crush on you, darling The long tan legs got me falling Ha ha! Ha ha! That's one of the, wow, that is a tornado It Wow. You're supposed to teach them how to fight, not have them flail around embarrassing themselves for five minutes so you can have a joygasm.